اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I start in the name of Allah, the beneficent and the merciful and I seek salvation from shaitan, the accursed. My dearest viewers, brothers and sisters from all over the world, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at all times. Welcome to another episode of the Ramadan show on Imam Hussain TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Once again, today will be your one-stop shop for your Ramadan needs, please join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube, insha'Allah. Before commencing with the show, I would like to quote a saying from Amir al Mu'mineen, where he says, A fool's mind is at the mercy of his tongue, and a wise man's tongue is under the control of his mind. So during this month, we must try to endeavor to think and to process things before talking because the sins of the tongue can be one of the causes that our soul cannot reach ascension and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll remain patient until patience tires of me. This is a quote by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. In today's spiritual refinement, I want to talk about patience and how we've learned from the Ahlul Bayt what patience truly is and how we can implement that in our day-to-day -day lives as well. Before we talk about patience, we must understand that there is many levels of being patient as well. And what sort of things do we need to be patient on? The first type of patience is the sabr or the patience on being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be persistent upon what He has asked from you. Secondly, it is important to be patient when afflicted with tests. Sometimes there are people in this world who are afflicted with natural disasters, poverty, problems with their health, deaths in families. And it is really important to remain patient when being faced with these challenges. After all, when we look to the life of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, we see that when he was facing problems with Muawiyah la'natullahi alayhi, he, pray, he played a protective role and a proactive role in keeping the Muslim Ummah together. Despite being isolated, he still remained patient. And despite facing all the trials that he faced, he still remained patient and tried to complete his mission. Thirdly, in a world that we live in where sin is all around us, it is really important to stay patient in the face of this world and the sins that we are, are, well, we are exposed to essentially. We have a world in which we live in uh, the internet age where everything is available at the tips of our fingers. It is very important to keep your Iman when faced with this particular challenge. When we look at the examples of the Ahlul Bayt, we see that in the life of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, when he was traveling to Hajj on foot, he was being mocked in the streets, even though he was the, the representative of Allah on this planet, he was still facing those trials, but yet he took it with grace and with patience. We look at the life of Lady Khadija, and we see that she, fa she faced trials and tests even though she had such a high station in this world. She left it all for the religion of Islam. She faced political, and political sanctions, economic sanctions until she died of fatigue. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are patient and surely patience brings us closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Patience is also an important quality to have in our day-to-day -day lives. It allows us 
to be calm, it allows us to think and rationalize things before we act upon them. Patience is one of the fundamentals, one of the fundamental qualities to achieving purification of your soul in order to improve yourself as a human being and also in order to get closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, when we look to the life of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, we see how patience plays such a significant role in his makeup, in how he was as a personality. Because you see, his Iman was at such a high quality that despite facing all these tribulations, even though he was the, 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 the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this planet, he still remained steadfast on his mission, on his goal, and he remained close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, you look at the life of Lady Khadija and we see similar qualities that she remained patient even though she had experienced a life of wealth, she still gave it all up for the religion of Islam. We also see from the lives of these great personalities that patience is not actually a stagnant thing. It is actually a proactive process. It is a process in, we much, in, in which we must reassess, contemplate and think about our life and the issues that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. I've mentioned this before and I'll continue to mention it again. We have to remember the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what beauty He has graced us with, all the things He's given to us in our lives. And when we face very, very few tests and tribulations in comparison to those great blessings that we have, we must remember that we must thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during those times. We must remain patient. And it's only then do you actually get closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Finally, I just want to remind the viewers at home about the event of Karbala. We see patience in its ultimate form. When Imam al Hussein faced an army of 30,000 in some narrations, he gave up his family, he sacrificed his own life, but remained patient just to save the mission of Allah to save the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to save the religion of Islam. In fact, I would go as far as saying he saved humanity and humankind by his sacrifice. Remember the sacrifice of Lady Zainab after the, the, the trip or, the, or, or the, uh, the long journey towards Kufa and Sham, how she remained steadfast in her beliefs, how she stood up against falsehood and, and tyranny. And remember the patience of Ummul Banin, a lady who knew that she had the strongest son in all of Arabia, a warrior. Yet, she, when, the, when the caravan returned to Medina, they told her what happened to Abbas, and the only thing she was thinking of is Hussein. And she asked people, how could Hussein be martyred if my Abbas was there by his side? We think about patience and we remember the story of Karbala because Karbala is the epitome of patience. And today we make a promise to ourselves and to our Lord that we will remain patient in the face of any tribulation. We will remain patient in service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will remain patient when we are exposed to sin around us. Inshallah we will continue our trip through the many traits that we can employ in order to achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to get on that spiral towards perfection ourselves inshallah in future episodes. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, was asked, O Prophet of Allah, which of the two months possesses a greater reward, Rajab or the month of Ramadan? The Holy Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, replied, Nothing can be compared to the month of Ramadan in terms of reward.
In this segment of the show, we talk about how people from around the world prepare their day-to-day -day lives for the month of Ramadan. So today I thought it would be worth talking about the home of Imam Rida, our eighth Imam alayhi salam, and talk a little bit about how the Mashhadi people prepare for this month, what they do in their day-to-day -day lives, as well as talking a little bit about what happens within the shrine itself for those of you who haven't visited. The Mashhadi people, obviously in the city of Mashhad, it is quite hot during the month, so they try to alter their day-to-day -day lives in order to make the most of this month. So what they would do, very similar to other countries around the world where it is very hot, is that they would try and alter their working hours in order to try and keep away from the heat of the day. The way they would do this is start very early in the morning and then shut their shops maybe around midday or early afternoon and then take a few hours off to rest and recuperate and then start working again during the evening hours because that's when the heat dies down. Of course the Mashhadi people also like to host their community members, their family and friends at their homes uh, for iftar and one specific thing that a lot of Mashhadi say is that during the month of Ramadan they try and visit the shrine more than any month during the year because they, they, they say that the rest of the year is for the zawar of Imam Rida alayhi salam, but they try and make use of the month of Ramadan and they say that is the month that they would go and they try and go as much as possible to the, to the shrine of Imam Rida alayhi salam. The shrine itself, for those of you who haven't been, is magnanimous, it's massive, it's one of the biggest shrines in the Shia world today. It consists of dozens of courtyards and obviously it hosts millions and millions of people throughout the course of the year. In fact, it is said that the tourism industry in Mashhad is the most booming out of any city in the country of Iran. In, f in fact, 10 times more people visit Mashhad than any other country in Iran. In the shrine, 24 hours a day, there are various recitations of the Holy Quran. You can find majlis, you can find a'mal, you can find munajat throughout the course of the day and night, people never stop. And you will find this in different sahans and being recited all over the shrine of Imam Rida alayhi salam. Also, what happens is that the shrine itself serves the zawar and the people who are there during the times of iftar and suhoor and there is uh, approximately 20,000 people come during the time of iftar and during the time of suhoor to try and benefit from this. So. If for those of you who haven't been to Mashhad, I suggest that you go and really try and experience the essence of this great city and this great shrine. And inshallah, we will show you more pictures of this, of this great shrine. Once again, I would like to remind all of you at home to send in your videos so we can observe and see and enter into your homes to see how you prepare for the month of Ramadan, how you alter your days, how you change your working habits in order to try and, then ad and adopt your lives for this holy month. Inshallah, we look forward to receiving your videos and we will also try and endeavor to air these videos so the rest of the world, from people from east to west, can see how you live your life. And inshallah, it will he help to bring our community closer together uh, in, in the love of Imam al Hussein and the Ahl al Bayt. Dearest viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said that the prayer is the pillar of the religion. And it has been recommended that when a believer wants to say his prayer, wear the best of his clothes and choose the best location. 
Today, we are in one of the stores that sells prayer mat. Prayer mat is one of the souvenirs that is so common in the holy city of Karbala. Every visitor who comes to the holy city of Karbala definitely take prayer mats as a souvenir with him. Dearest viewers, another place in the holy city of Karbala and brother Zuhair. Salaamu alaykum. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Bikum akthar ajal. Mumkin titfadhalinna an wadhiyat al-zuwar fi Madinat Karbala al-Muqaddasa? Wallah Karbala al-Aman fiha, wal-zuwar dayjoon, wirhoon, wizuroon. Yani mertahin yikunun kulhum. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Barakat al-Husayn wa akhih Aba al-Fadl al-Abbas. Brother Zuhair is saying that uh, the, the life in the whole city of Karbala is so normal and because of the blessings of Imam al Hussein and his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, all the visitors are in a safe place in the holy city of Karbala. Okay, Mr. Zuhair, can you tell us the most of the people who are in this place? We are in this place, 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 we are in Karbala al-Muqaddas and in Iran. وعندنا بضاعة السجاد يجينا من تركيا وعندنا السجاد والتحفيات من الصين I asked a brother Zuhair about what do they sell here. Uh, he said that uh, we mainly sell here uh, the prayer mats and uh, flags. The prayer mats mainly come from uh, Iran, Turkey, and uh, there are some production that uh, has been product here in the holy city of Karbala. About the flags, he said that we sell uh, different types of flags with the holy names of uh, Ahlul Bayt and Prophet Muhammad on them. On some of them, uh, for example, it has been written Ya Hussein or Ya Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and so on. Today in our medical health tips, we'll be talking about a topic that is actually really, really common in the society that we live in. And a lot of people suffer from this sort of problem. However, in our communities, we seem to shy away from it. And it's considered a taboo. And what I want to talk about is mental health. As a, as a doctor and as a general practitioner, a lot of my patients who come to me suffer from mental health and they have a multitude of different problems, different issues that arise from this condition. Inshallah, I'll be going a little bit into each one, but I think it's really important firstly to talk a little bit about the, the proportion of the population that actually suffer from this problem and as a community how we can do more to help them. And also, I want to talk a little bit about why it's become such a taboo in our communities to talk about such an issue. Firstly, it's very important to stress on the fact that mental health isn't a problem that is caused only by the person's um, uh, uh, the environment 
or medication that they're taking or other things that could be um, affecting that person. Sometimes mental health problems come because of genetic makeup because there are certain neurotransmitters in the brain that work in a different way to the rest of ours. It is not their fault that they suffer from these conditions. There's a lot of people in our communities that have things like depression and they take medication for it and often because of that they feel ashamed but really it's important to realize that it is like any other medical condition. It is like having diabetes or having heart problems, having high cholesterol or asthma. If you suffer from this problem, it is because a certain neurotransmitter in your brain which conducts the sympathetic, the, the noradrenaline and, and serotonin in the brain isn't firing the neurotransmission as quickly as other, other people who don't have the condition. So people who do have depression, they suffer a lot from it and it can really affect their self-confidence, it can affect their self-esteem and some people get so down because of it, they can't break out of the shackles of the condition and often they find it very difficult to seek help. And that's why I feel as a community it's very important for us to address this because those people who cannot seek help from family members or friends because they feel ashamed, they should have someone who they can go to in confidence, someone who can help them so that they can address this issue because the first and most important part of realizing or in fact treating this condition is realizing that you've got it in the first place, acknowledging it and also seeking support for it. Because if you just try and face these conditions by yourself, they become burdensome, they start overwhelming you, and they just become worse and worse until you can't do anything about it. Obviously, depression is one of the most commonest uh, mental health problems that we do have in society and in the population, but there are other mental health conditions that we must also think about and be aware of. Certain conditions such as schizophrenia, in which people lose insight into their day-to-day -day lives and often people who get into this cycle and they have schizophrenia within our communities receive no help whatsoever in fact the communities are quick to sweep it under the carpet and they they come out with things like this person is possessed they 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 request the help of spiritual healers to try and exorcise those demons but in fact this is a significant medical condition that these people have and they require help from it for it when they suffer from psychotic episodes due to schizophrenia they don't have insight into what they're doing and at those times it is essential that as family members you pick up that there is uh, an underlying problem an underlying issue that needs to be addressed and seek help from not uh, a spiritual healer but from a medical professional because there are medications that we can give and medications that we can prescribe, people that we can refer these, these patients onto who can actually help them to overcome these problems. Other mental health conditions, there are, there are a multitude of different conditions such as bipolar disorder where instead of having depression people tend to have fluctuations so they have very elevated moods and they can become psychotic during these episodes. It's very important again to seek help from the right people and if you can, try and get your family members involved, try and get them to help you to get through those hard times. Because to face these times alone is very, very difficult as an individual. As a community and as a society, I think that there is a lot we can do to try and help people who suffer from mental health conditions. In many communities, in my own community, I know we have health clinics where we measure people's blood sugar levels, where we measure their blood pressure, where we do other tests in order to see if people are healthy. But I've never ever seen within our communities a counsellor being employed or someone who can help with mental health issues, someone who can see beyond just the physical side of someone's health. Because essentially this condition does play a huge impact not only on your, on your own life, not only on your family's life, but on society as a whole. People who can contribute so positively to society find themselves shackled down by mental health problems. Finally, I just want to remind you at home that if there are people around you, people in your community who suffer from these conditions, it is very important that you are there for support. You are there to help them. Because 
as a community we have to grow together and help one another out and these are people who can really have a positive contribution to society, to your community. It is really important to identify as a family people who could be suffering from mental health problems, people who could be self-harming because these are the first signs that there is an, un, a profound underlying condition and something that someone needs help for. Inshallah, I pray that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us elevation, not only spiritually but also in our health. And inshallah, I hope that you've learned something from this very short talk about mental health because surely these people do need our help and they, they genuinely do have a medical problem. So please be supportive towards them. Do not ignore what they're saying. Do not sweep it under the carpet or start making excuses like possession or, or someone who needs exorcism. Please consider this to be a medic medical problem and as a community try and do more to help them. And inshallah if we do that, we can all be more successful as a community and ascend and achieve closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. normal in today's world that leaders misuse the wealth of their nations and live in luxury while the rest of the citizens live in poverty. It's actually so normal that no one even bats an eyelash at such mismanagement. However, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahl al-Bayt peace be upon them show us that they are an exception. Once a man named Harun visited Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and found him wearing an old rough garment and shivering from cold. He asked himself, how could a man and how could this man, the leader of the Muslim world, be lacking warm, decent clothing despite the, the enormous amount of wealth at his disposal? Harun asked, O oh, the commander of the believers, you and the Ahl al-Bayt are just like any other citizen and have a share of, of the public treasury. Why don't you use your share to purchase more comfortable and warm clothing? Imam Ali Nabi Talib smiled and said, by God, I do not I do not take anything from the public treasury and the clothes that I am wearing are the same ones I bought from Medina and are the only ones I own. Even as a young man, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib exemplified the qualities of charity and restrained himself from worldly luxuries. One day Prophet Muhammad wasallam noticed that Imam Ali was wearing a worn out garnet. So the Messenger of Allah asked, what happened to the good garment I gave you? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw one of your companions complaining that he and his wife had no, wear, had no clothes to wear. So I, gave, so I gave it away to him, remembering that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only reward me in this world but in the hereafter as well. Examples like these from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt teach us to rely only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to never worry and become cheap when giving to others, especially the poor ones. I would like to leave you with this quote by the Ahlul Bayt where they say Man qadha li akhihi al-mu'min haja qadha Allah lahu sab'een haja Whoever fulfills a favor for his brother or sister, for his mu'min or brother, sister, mu'mina Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill 70 of his favors Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In today's episode, I want to dedicate the poetry or the nasheed that I'm going to be reciting to the most valuable asset and resource that we have as human beings. And that isn't money, it's in fact time. Time is so limited, we're gifted with a very short span of time on this earth and we have to make sure that we make the most of it. This nasheed is called Time Waits for No One, it's written by myself and my brother Abbas. And it highlights the importance of making use of your time and also asking for forgiveness because if you have wronged someone and you don't ask for forgiveness before your time runs out, then surely on the day of judgment you're answerable for that. 
The world keeps on turning. People are moving. The seconds are ticking away. As I lay in my bed, I think to myself, have I just lost another day? I'm embarrassed by shame with no one to blame for the errors I've made today. To correct my mistakes, gotta do what it takes before it becomes too late. Have I righted the wrongs? Is my ego too strong to say that I'm sorry? Can I go on like this? My soul full of sin It is ever my worry Have I asked for forgiveness For all that I've done Cause time, time Time waits for no one Who knows tomorrow May never come Cause time, time Time waits for Time no, waits for one. no one. one. The rule of life is, life is as a new life new begins, life begins another, another comes to an end. end. Every, Every breath, breath is, a is a gift, you must cherish you must it. Cherish It'll never it. come never back come again. Back. Never change who Never change you are who you and follow, and follow your, heart. your heart. The truth is, the truth within, is within yourself. Within Put your faith in faith Allah. In Allah. He, will he will show you the path. The path. If you face troubles, you face troubles he, will he will help. When you fall out of love and you have had enough, your heart has stopped feeling. When your soul cries aloud, let you no clue about this life and its meaning. Have I asked for forgiveness for all that I've done? Cause time, time, time waits for no one who knows tomorrow may never come. Cause time, time, time waits for no one. I've wronged myself and you every day. I ask for your assistance along the way. You gave me what I need, this world that I see. And yet my yet lust and greed deafens and blinds me, drives me away from you, drags me away from the truth. Please show me the way, the way back to you. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, was asked, O Prophet of Allah, which of the two months possesses a greater reward, Rajab or the month of Ramadan? The Holy Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, replied, Nothing can be compared to the month of Ramadan in terms of reward. As I end this episode, I just want to leave you with a final thought, a final reminder and a philosophy that you can carry on in this month in order to try and help you to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The thought that I want to leave you with is 
a very interesting philosophy, something that I've had in my mind for a while, is that there is no such thing as a bad experience. After all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the capabilities that you have and the limits of your capability. And He has promised never to test you beyond the boundaries of those capabilities. So remember, whenever you're faced with trials and challenges and tests in life, that this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He's trying to make you into a stronger person. Always look at these tests and look at how they're improving you as an individual because essentially we are all on a spiral towards perfection and nearness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use these trials, these challenges, these experiences to improve as a person and to have a positive impact on other people's lives. And inshallah you will see yourself ascending not only spiritually but physically as, as well. Finally I would like to remind you once again to send your pictures, to send your videos of your month of Ramadan into us so we can air it. And finally please do not forget us in your du'as and especially do not forget the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam in your du'as. I hope to be seeing you again very soon with another episode of the Ramadan show. Until then, please continue to do the good work and continue to get closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.